Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the online meeting for the rezoning and neighborhood concept plan at 727 and 803 Hart Road. My name is Catherine Cambites, and I'm a senior planner with the Planning and Development Division. I'm joined by Daryl Dawson, the Development Review Manager with the Planning and Development Division. Good evening, everyone. And I'm also joined by Toby Esterby, who is the Executive Director with Camponi Housing Corporation. Thanks for coming, everyone. And finally, Haven Reese, who is also a planner in the Planning and Development Division, who will be assisting us tonight. Good evening, everyone. Councillor Wanchak uh, has also noted that she is here. Um, she is your council representative for your area. This is our first online meeting and we certainly appreciate your patience as we move through this format. Please note that the meeting will be recorded and posted on the Engage page. This will allow residents who were unable to participate to watch the video at a later date. Tonight, we're hoping to answer some of the questions you may have about this proposal. And we will begin with a presentation from the city, followed by a presentation from Camponi Housing Corporation. Please type any questions you may have into the question and answer box, and I will read them out following the presentations. We ask that you keep those comments respectful. And with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Dawson. All right, thank you, Catherine. And once again, thank you everyone for joining us for this online meeting tonight. So as Catherine noted, Camponi Housing has submitted an application to amend the Blairmore concept plan and rezone 727 and 803 Hart Road from an RM2 low medium density multiple unit dwelling district to an M3 general institutional service district subject to a zoning agreement. Now 727 and 803 Hart Road are located in the Blairmore Suburban Centre. Now the Blairmore Shopping Centre is located just to the north of the site Stormwater Pond to the west, and a dwelling group to the east and to the south, we have the Park Ridge Residential Extension. The site to the north of the parcel is zone DCD6, so that's the regional uh, regional retail uh, site uh, where the Walmart and the Lowe's is located. We have the B3 zoning district to the north with the strip mall, and an M3 district to the north uh, east where we have uh, multiple unit dwellings. The site to the east, uh, directly to the east is zoned RM2 and the residential sites to the south are zoned an R1B low density residential zoning district. I do want to note that the two parcels are divided by a registered walkway that provides both pedestrian and emergency access between Hart Road and Fortosky Crescent uh, to the south. This walkway will remain as a registered walkway. The sites are designated as an urban center on the city's official community plan. The land designated as an urban centre in the official community plan has the potential for a mix of medium density residential, institutional and community uses that complement related urban centre commercial sites. Urban centres support all modes of transportation by incorporating transit oriented development uh, into a comprehensively planned sites. And these sites are typically served by a collector arterial street. Now this slide uh, that's up now shows the concept plan for the Blairmore Suburban Centre. Uh, I do have an aerial to the a red arrow pointing to the sites that are subject uh, to the amendments. The sites are currently identified as low to medium density and to accommodate the mixed use development, uh, Camponi Housing Corporation is applying to have the concept plan amendment uh, to designate these sites as institutional. The institutional designation is the same as you see for the lands to the east of Trineski Park in the blue. As mentioned, the sites are currently zoned RM2, low medium density, multiple unit residential district. To provide for development of, of, of the specific proposal, Camponi Housing Corporation has applied to rezone the sites to an M3 general institutional service district subject to a zoning agreement. Now a zoning agreement, also referred to as contract zoning, is a planning tool that is used to provide for a specific development proposal and may address the use of land and building form of development, site layout, and general external design. If a zoning agreement is approved by City Council for a site, only that development may occur. 
The proposed rezoning to an M3 district subject to agreement will provide for a mixed use development consisting of six three story buildings that would be developed in two phases. And the first phase would be located on 727 Hart Road and the second phase on 803 Hart Road. Uh, the development would include 158 residential dwelling units, six units for special needs housing, a daycare, community space, offices and limited commercial and institutional uses. The proposed community space, offices and limited commercial and institutional uses would be located in the buildings that front onto Hart Road. The residential portion of the development will include a mix of one, two and four bedroom units. There's a total of 209 parking spaces proposed for the development. 88 of those parking spaces would be in phase one on 727 Hart Road and 121 parking spaces provided in phase two. This would provide a parking for residential units at a ratio of approximately one parking space per dwelling unit, with the remaining uh, approximate 45 spaces being available for the other uses on the site. And these buildings are three stories tall and will range in height from 10 meters for the buildings located along the south, east and west property lines, and 11.8 meters for the buildings that front onto Hart Road. For comparison, the RM2 zone properties to the east would have a maximum building height of 10 meters. So it's important to note that the buildings adjacent to that site would have the same building height. And the property zone R1B district to the south would have a maximum building height of 9 meters. Enhanced landscaping is being proposed along the south property line of the development to add an additional screening for the one unit dwellings located in the R1B district to the south in the Park Ridge extension. And it's just important to note too that with this development, uh, the, the zoning by agreement provides for uh, uses that would be allowed under the RM2 with the addition of the office and the, and the limited commercial and institutional uses. I mentioned that this site was going to be zoned subject to an agreement and the zoning agreement does take the form of a bylaw that has to be approved by City Council. The proposed zoning agreement for this development would provide for the use of lands, which noted would be a mixed use development consisting of the residential dwelling units, special needs housing, a daycare, community space, offices, and limited commercial and institutional uses. A maximum building height would be prescribed in the zoning agreement of 11.8 meters, and that the buildings could be a maximum of three stories only. The agreement would address the number of parking spaces, landscaping requirements, and any other specific zoning regulations needed. So the next steps in this proposal uh, that planning will be taking will be to prepare a report to City Council with the recommendations on the application. We do are required to advertise these sort of amendments and ads will be in the Star Phoenix this weekend and, and uh, City Council will, uh, will be presented with the application for consideration at a public hearing that is scheduled for September 28th at 6 p.m. And I do want to note that the engage page will be updated with this detail. Uh, we'll be working on that tomorrow. Now at the public hearing, City Council will hear from administration, the applicant, and any member of the public who would like to speak. At this time, due to COVID-19, uh, City Council meetings are all being held online. However, requests to speak to Council at a public hearing can still be made. Written comments may also be submitted to City Council and information will be available on making application to, for any comments to City Council uh, through through notice. And we can answer any questions further on on the process later on. And, and that concludes my part of the presentation. And I just want to thank everyone again for joining us tonight. Thank you, Daryl. And uh, I'll take my turn speaking now. Uh, once again, I want to start out by welcoming everybody. Thank you for taking the time out of your evening to learn a little bit more about the proposal being submitted by Camponi Housing Corporation. Uh, I'll introduce myself again, Toby Esterby. Uh, I am the Executive Director of Camponi Housing Corporation, uh, and I also serve as the President of the Board of the Saskatoon Housing Initiatives Partnership. Uh, I want to take a, about five to ten minutes here to show you a little bit more about who we are and what we're doing. My goals are to show you a little bit about Camponi and how we got to where we are here today, uh, why we felt this project was important for the city of Saskatoon, 
why we selected this location for the project and then get into a little bit about the particulars of the design that you've been seeing on the website and the engage page. Uh, so with that, let's get started. Uh, Camp Pony Housing Corporation uh, has been around in one form or another in continuous fashion since 1973. Uh, it was founded in 1973 as a Métis organization uh, by a group of individuals sitting around a coffee table one morning and looking at the complex needs of individuals that were homeless in the city of Saskatoon. Uh, a lot of these young, in the, at that time, young men and women were Métis or other Indigenous folks that that needed assistance, needed housing, and just had nowhere to turn. And that's where the original vision of housing in the city of Saskatoon uh, started. And it's evolved through the years. Uh, what's happened over the last five decades is with consistent leadership and consistent financial stability, we find ourselves in a, in a very very good position of strength. Uh, our, our portfolio is currently approximately 400 homes. Uh, we have about $80 million in unreserved assets. Uh, we have fully funded reserves. Uh, we have a very unique and effective governance structure uh, that helps us navigate complex financial arrangements. And we've grown to become the largest nonprofit housing provider in the city of Saskatoon. <clears throat> Excuse me. So with that strength, we came to the table a few years ago and looked at what we needed to do to carry on that tradition and carry on that vision and mission through the next 50 years. Uh, we looked at the future of Camponi housing and realized that it came down to two very fundamental things. We needed sturdy houses and we needed supported homes related but two very different things a sturdy house is a thing that you can hold in your hands it is quality construction it's quality and tested materials uh fixtures things like that that we know are going to be quality and, and not have to be replaced and not break and things like that our housing needs to be attractive and appealing it needs to be housing that our tenants can be proud to call home uh, and we need to be financial, financially sustainable. So we need to make sure, <clears throat> excuse me, we need to make sure that our housing and our company is here for the many years to come. Housing need in Saskatoon, especially for Métis and Indigenous families, is not going to go away anytime soon. We need to make sure that we are there to serve it. The other half of what the organization has come to do in the last few years is to support those families in those homes. Uh, we started holistically supporting each and every one of our families through tenant engagement and wraparound services. We ensure that the support we provide is culturally appropriate. Uh, we have created a, a number of very important strategic community partnerships, be that with other community-based organizations or the Reaching Home Program with the federal government or Saskatchewan Housing Corporation or the City of Saskatoon. And where it's got us is a point where we have different types of housing throughout the housing continuum. So the housing continuum is a term you'll hear once in a while when you're talking about things in our sector, where it covers everything from someone experiencing chronic homelessness all the way up to home ownership, home ownership, pardon me. And in between those points, are a number of steps that people must navigate as they get their feet under them and find stability in their housing. So our role in this project is to try and serve a few of the stops, but not all, of the housing continuum and provide that support throughout it. So we need to look at what the key to that stable housing is. And when we talk to our tenants, when I talk to my staff, when we talk to other organizations, the key to feeling like you are in a home instead of a house is community. So the big questions for us moving forward was how does Camp Pony Housing position itself to make the biggest positive impact on the lives of our tenants? How do we make it so that they can be proud to call their place home so that they can find that stability? How can Camp Pony Housing contribute to the city of Saskatoon? This project that we're proposing is of a grand scale. 
this right now we have over 400 homes in our portfolio. This would see that increase by about 20 to 25 percent. That's a not an insignificant amount of housing in the city of Saskatoon. That's a small community in and of itself. How do we make sure that we are contributing to the city of Saskatoon with that portfolio? But most importantly, how do our tenants connect to the community around them? So how are they connecting to schools? How are they connecting to shopping? How are they connecting to health services? How are they connecting to social and leisure? And most importantly, how are they connecting to their neighbors? So with those questions, we started working on this project and really the answers to what is the solution? So what I'd like to show everyone now over the next few slides uh, are some of the renderings for our proposed development. Uh, these images and the more detailed floor plans and design aspects have been available to view at our temporary storefront. Uh, they're on our website as well at camponi.ca and some of them have been on the city's uh, engage page. As you may have seen, we're proposing an ambitious and exciting project. Uh, we're, we're building a neighborhood. We believe this is exactly what the community needs for this space. It is absolutely what the people we serve need. Uh, safe, sustainable, affordable homes that are truly connected to the city around them. The site configuration has been carefully considered to create a thriving community within itself. Uh, the neighborhood allows flow through to invite the adjacent neighborhoods to share in the public spaces and the services provided within the development and for the community to access the adjacent public park areas. That's important to us. We want to make sure that our neighbors in Park Ridge or the Park, park Ridge Extension or Kensington uh, or the Blairmore uh, district can be a part of some of the things that we are doing within this new neighborhood. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, sight lines and street views have been designed to integrate seamlessly with the surrounding areas. Uh, Daryl mentioned about the, the, the height of the buildings. We've made sure that our building heights flow naturally from the surrounding houses, from the surrounding townhouse developments, a natural flow into our neighborhood. There's no sudden change in height of building or anything like that. Uh, phase one will see the creation of the eastern section of the neighborhood, as Daryl mentioned, uh, complete with Camponi office space and common areas. We are going to be moving uh, a good chunk of our administration operation to this office space. Uh, that will mean that we have staff on site. That will mean that we have maintenance on site. That will mean that we have a grounds crew on site. That will mean that we have security on site 24 seven. And that's really, really, really very important to us. Uh, phase two sees the creation of the western section of the neighborhood. Uh, that, that includes an opportunity for community public space and for social enterprise uh, retail units as well along Hart Road. Uh, we envision those as somewhat of an incubator type setup for retail, small retail and small business to start up uh, in partnership with some other organizations in the city. Uh, the housing itself is going to, be going to be a variety of one, uh, two and four bedroom units uh, with fully accessible ground floor units incorporated into the neighborhood. Uh, we are building three stories or we're proposing to build three stories. <clears throat> The entire ground floor is at grade uh, and the entire ground floor of the entire development will be fully wheelchair accessible. This is designed complete with turning circles and radiuses in all rooms of all the units uh, and roll in showers. Now this is important to us because that targets a very specific housing gap in the city of Saskatoon. These units are looking at seniors and elders uh, that are dealing with mobility issues or full accessibility need, as well as uh, an emerging need in the city of individuals uh, experiencing acquiring, acquired brain injury or other injuries that have left them with mobility issues. Uh, that group is uh, severely underserved in the city of Saskatoon's housing and we're hoping to be able to provide a more affordable option for many, many people in that. <clears throat> the larger units serve an affordable housing gap in the community as well. A home able to fit a larger family without overcrowding. Our four bedroom units are four bedrooms, two bathrooms, 
open concept living room and kitchen. Uh, each unit has its own modest outdoors deck area. Um, these are homes that all of us would be very happy to call home. Half of my staff is trying to figure out how they can get into housing and they have to wait in line. Uh, the, the reality of these units is, is that it's the layout recognizes that more and more family units are often multi-generational or perhaps see caregivers that are caring for their own children as well as other familial children or elders and seniors. But the family structures are changing, especially in Métis and other Indigenous families, as the effects of years of lack of housing start to work out of the system. We need to make sure that there's this adequate housing in place so that people can move forward. The keys to a safe and connected community, which is very important to us, start with a casual social connection with neighbors. You'll see in our design that each unit has a door on the street and an outdoor garden or a deck that overlooks the street. Everybody's door opens to the internal roadways of this project. So everybody's got a front door. This isn't an apartment building. This isn't some motel style thing. Everybody has a front door to call their own. <clears throat> it's a model based on uh, neighborhoods that you would see uh, in a similar structure in places like Montreal, uh, where older communities have regenerated themselves over and over and over for more than a century and rents have remained low and housing has remained accessible and affordable because of how nice it is to be able to have those doors side by side like that. This helps to ensure people connect on a daily basis. Uh, there are always eyes on the street. Uh, the casual interaction is further enhanced by connecting the children. Uh, the tenants of this development are less likely to have cars. That is just a, a black and white fact in affordable housing that vehicle ownership is not as high as other sectors. Uh, we did do a little bit of a study into that in our own portfolio and uh, with other social housing providers in the city and confirmed that our vehicle ownership was in the neighborhood of 30 to 40 percent. So not even close to one vehicle per home. The parking spots that are in this in this uh, in this proposed development uh, with the lack of vehicles now have the ability to be used for maybe basketball courts or street hockey, transitional spaces, whatever it might be, as well as possibly temporary garden boxes or mini park areas similar to innovation seen across uh, Canada and in Saskatoon recently with the advent of the parking day. Um, the community will be further enhanced with social enterprise, uh, commercial retail units facing Hart Road, as well as a public community space that can act as a community center both summer and winter. Uh, the community space is going to be located to bridge the neighborhood back to the larger community spanning from Hart Road to the internal streets. Uh, we and our community spaces, we have the vision of having them be used and accessible by the neighbors of our development as well too. We're going to have some really interesting public spaces. We're going to have some of our own uh, spaces, a, a small gym with a commercial kitchen facility, uh, different areas, different rooms that you can rent, different places that you can just come and visit and hang out with some elders. Um, it, it's, it's, we're really trying to establish a great community within a community. So finally, our goal with Camponi, Camponi Housing is to be able to support and shape the interaction of the of the neighborhood with our offices and services located on site. So this this provides services and support to our community members. It will provide security and mediation to manage any potential conflicts uh, that are a normal part of any community. Uh, Camponi Housing will be co-locating several like minded organizations. Uh, those types of conversations happen on a daily basis in my world where other community based organizations or other governmental uh, offices or organizations need to find ways to engage the public, not just our tenants, but the public in general and opportunities like this to co-locate services really streamline the process for how the public accesses some of the things that need to be navigated throughout the community. <clears throat> 
excuse me, with the flow through of the design, it will also benefit the surrounding neighborhoods. So Blairmore, uh, South Kensington, Park Ridge, and especially, of course, the Park Ridge extension. Uh, we are going to make sure that the natural pedestrian walkways and the flow throughs of the neighborhood are, are maintained and and improved even we want to make sure that there's a path to the walking trails that are around the retention pond we want to make sure that the pathway to dairy queen ice cream which is one of my favorite stops um is still there and, and you're able to go through a community through a walkway and feel like you are part of a neighborhood that is in, engaging and vibrant uh, we're really looking forward to showing just how wonderful of a neighbor Camponi housing and our tenants can be. So we're excited to be engaged in the community consultation. Um, I've been set up here in our uh, temporary storefront uh, for about six weeks now. Um, I, you know, I, I'm grateful for those that have come to come to see a little bit more about what we're doing here. Uh, and the images that you see on the walls behind me and that others that are in here are going to continue to be up on uh, Camponi's website as well too. So we're very excited to be that much closer to being able to make this incredible addition to our great city. Um, and, and again, thank you everybody who is listening. Um, I appreciate you taking time out of your evening and uh, I'm looking forward to answering any questions you may have. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Esterby and Mr. Dawson for the presentations. We'll now move to questions and a number of questions have already come in. So the first question um, indicates, please define special needs housing. And Daryl, I believe this was through your presentation. So if you're able to, to answer that question. Sorry, Daryl, I believe you're on mute. So I win the uh, prize for the first person to talk while being on mute. I apologize, everyone. Uh, the special needs housing is defined in the zoning bylaw. Uh, it means a multiple unit dwelling or dwelling group operated by a nonprofit corporation or public authority and used exclusively for the domestic habitation of senior citizens, disabled persons, occupants of subsidized housing, or the cohabitation of uh, spouse and other children or persons noted to, uh, above. So a special needs housing is defined in the zoning bylaw uh, in those terms and that definition can be looked up in the zoning bylaw if you wanted to read it further. Thank you, Daryl. Um, the second question that we have here is in relation to uh, where could someone see other properties in the city of Saskatoon, other Camponi properties? Uh, there I am. Uh, we have properties uh, throughout the city, actually. Um, a lot of, depending on when the housing was acquired, uh, there was different different periods and different programming along the way through the 80s and 70s and 80s and 90s. So it, there's little concentrations of things throughout the city, and then there's some scattered site single dwelling units. Um, for the most part, I would say about uh, 75 to 80 percent of our portfolio uh, is located on the west half of Saskatoon, I guess, if we use the traditional terrible Idlewild divide line of, of east and west. Um, three quarters to 80 percent of our, our portfolio is on the, uh, the west side of Saskatoon. Um, the where the housing is located is indicative of where how the programs worked in the 70s and 80s and 90s when uh, our organization would apply to the programming to acquire housing often we were relegated to housing that was at the edge of the city so you'll see us uh, in the confederation neighborhood because that used to be the edge of the city and then you'll see us in the neighborhood around Massey Place or 33rd, where because that used to be the edge of the city. 
uh, we have a bit of housing in the Adelaide Churchill area because that used to be the edge of the city. Uh, and so over the years, those single dwelling units, uh, some have been, some we still own, uh, some have been uh, sold and some have been torn down and we've built new homes. Uh, so like a few of the different projects that we've done, uh, there's some on Brown Crescent, for example, and Avenue O South where we just, just built uh, accessible duplexes. Um, those are some good examples. Uh, we have a, a senior housing complex on uh, Diefenbaker called La Petite Ville. Um, it's a very simple, modest uh, senior home uh, that, that a lot of the people on this, uh, this presentation might actually drive by. Um, I'm trying to think of things that might be in the neighborhood too. Um, the, we have an apartment building. We do have an apartment building on 22nd Street, uh, about 22nd and Avenue uh, R, I think it is. Um, it will be the one that has the grass cut. That's how we stand out. Um, we have our Edwards Manor supported living facility that is on Avenue W North. Um, and there's a few different places like that. Um, the other thing too, uh, for this neighborhood, I know something that's come up uh, just in dialogue with folks as they come into the storefront here. Um, ironically, the housing that many in this neighborhood might be familiar with uh, isn't ours. There's a significant housing development at Camponi Place, uh, which is off the end of Fairlight, I think. Um, in that neck of the woods uh, that a lot of these a lot of you folks might drive by. Um, ironically, the streets named after the same fellow that our company's named after, but we have nothing to do with the project. So um, that's that's not one of our housing, uh, one, not one of our housing locations. Thank you, Mr. Esterby. Uh, the next question that we have is in relation to crime. So uh, the question is, what are the crime specs in the area um, when it comes to affordable or low income housing compared to other areas? Uh, I don't know if we've got any uh, direct information on crime uh, specs in the area, but Daryl, do you want to maybe take a take that question or Toby, whichever? I'll, I'll maybe start uh, Catherine and then, and then if, if Toby would like to add just based on his experience, but uh, we do know that there's there, there's many environmental social uh, conditions that lead to crime, not just one particular uh, around a type of housing unit. We know density for sure does not uh, contribute to housing uh, uh, or crime in the area uh, that we've been able to uh, evaluate. And Toby, I don't know if you would like to add further based on your experiences uh, from your developments. Yeah, it's it's hard to gauge. Like the, it, I, I appreciate the question. I, I I understand where you're coming from. The it, it's the crime aspect and the and low income housing or affordable housing are often associated, and it's it's not really completely a fair association. What happens is is that you end up with a lot of the community based organizations like ours, like I said, were relegated to specific areas of, of the community. So the planning and more importantly, the funding in the 80s and 90s created little pockets of, of housing. The other thing that's happened is that as the city has grown more suburban, uh, we've seen obviously what some of the challenges of neighborhoods like Pleasant Hill or um, you know, Ribsdale or Caswell, things like that. Uh, where you start, you get the lag in between uh, where infill and regeneration of neighborhoods uh, starts to take place. We have some challenges in Saskatoon, um, especially in the last year or so. Uh, our addiction crisis is is out of control right now. Um, if if I advocate for anything other than myself tonight, that is find out what you can do to help that. It's uh, it, it it is it is the single single thing that would make a huge change in the community if we started treating treating addiction like a disease. Uh, that's my five second soapbox on that. Um, 
the crime related to that, so things that you see in the news, right? Property crime, um, the petty thefts, the the maybe more violent crimes. Uh, we hear, you know, the the media sensationalizes sensationalizes the gang stuff, uh, and and it's very real. Uh, but it's not necessarily the low rent, low rent, affordable housing sector that is causing that. It's just that those are the neighborhoods that our organizations, a lot of our organizations can afford to own homes in. Uh, a lot of the rentals are located in those. A lot of the private landlords are located in those areas. Uh, one of the partnerships that we have in the community is uh, with uh, the SPS and, and we work with them uh, in a program called the Crime Free Multi Housing Program. All of our apartment buildings are actually certified in the Crime Free Multi Housing Program in partnership with SPS. So, what that means is that we have to go through a rigorous checklist of safety and amenity items that our apartment buildings, uh, at our, that our dwelling units have to have to make them safer. And we are held to a higher standard of what the upkeep of that property is, uh, what the expectations of the ownership of that property is. And then from that, as the Crime Free Multi Housing Program, the benefit for us is that we get updates on any activity related to our buildings. So if there was an event that happened in one of Camponi's apartment buildings last night, I would get an email about it today and I would have no names or anything like that, but I would have the incident and I would have the time. And if they had the unit number associated with it, I would have that. So then Camponi Housing takes that information and we work with that tenant if we know who it is or that building if we can't figure out who it is and get to the bottom of it. We have a zero tolerance rule for gang activity. We have a zero tolerance rule for violent crime and we have a very strict rule set of rules around other property theft, other property damage, everything like that. Uh, you, we want to support our tenants, but we also want to make sure that our tenants are safe. So an unsafe individual living in our housing that's causing a risk to the safety of the neighborhood or our or their neighbors in the buildings themselves is not welcome in Camponi housing and we take those steps. <clears throat> The other thing that I'll go off of that, just just while we're talking about uh, the worry of, of, of crime, uh, is that all of our uh, apartment buildings, uh, the single dwelling units, we don't do this because we're it's not something you can do, but our, in our apartment buildings, every single one of them is extensively cameraed. Uh, we obviously don't have cameras in any anyone's homes, but uh, doors are cameraed, outsides are cameraed, and that is our intent with this neighborhood as well too. We're not going to shine a camera that can see in anybody's windows. We're not going to shine a camera that can see in anybody's backyards, but I am going to make sure that we can see our internal roadways, our doors, our fences, our back lanes, everything like that in real time with staff on the cameras so that we can make Make sure that we are creating and maintaining a safe neighborhood. Thank you, Mr. Esterby. I just want to note that we currently have uh, 32 questions in the queue, so um, just please be patient with us as we, we try to move through them the best that we can. Uh, Mr. Esterby, I believe this is another question for you. You had mentioned uh, transient housing and home ownership in your presentation, I believe. Um, maybe just go over the housing or the proposed housing tenor, tenure for your project. Yeah, sure. Sorry if I miscommunicated something there. This, this is a real black and white one, how we do business. So Camponi Housing, uh, we are a affordable rental housing provider. Uh, so Camponi Housing is maintaining ownership of all of the units in this development. Uh, we intend to maintain ownership of all of these units. <clears throat> excuse me. Ownership of all of these units for the life of these units and, and we're building them so they last a damn long time. Uh, we only do rentals. Uh, we've we've done little pilot projects with down payment assistance plans and things like that to encourage home ownership, but we've not provided 
the the homes we, we these aren't being flipped to condos or townhouses or something like that uh and so just rentals and the other thing too i guess just to to the, the word transient if i if i slip that into my presentation i apologize it's, that's not something that we're we don't do transient housing uh there is absolutely a need in the city for emergency housing uh right now currently camponi housing does not provide emergency housing in the city there's a number of organizations that do one heck of a job of doing that uh, we have not ventured into that part of the housing continuum yet um, the 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 housing that we have here we intend to have long-term rentals we we want to have people call this home uh, by creating a home for somebody, you create stability. By creating stability, you create create vitality in a neighborhood. We want these homes to be occupied for years. Uh, we have we have a remarkable amount of tenants actually that have been tenants of ours for 20 plus years. Almost 25 percent of our portfolio have been in their homes for 20 or more years, which is an absolutely incredible number that we're very proud of. Thank you. Um, the next question will be for you, um, Mr. Astorby as well. Is this the, uh, sorry, is this the design does not resemble our community whatsoever is the comment. So can you explain a little bit the rationale for your design and how um, you see that fitting into the neighborhood or how it suits the neighborhood? Yeah, you bet. Um, it, so we have two very different parts of our design. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the, I'm going to turn my, you probably can't see it behind me. Over my shoulder is, well, you can't see it, it's too far away. Um, we have our office building that is a very unorthodox building. It is absolutely unorthodox. It's facing Hart Road. So that building is going to be uh, looking at the suburban shopping, er shopping area. Uh, we, we wanted it to stand out. Uh, it will make a lot more sense when we build it and put signage on it. It's, it's drawing its colors from the traditional colors of the Métis sash. Uh, there'll be some things to tie it all together. So that's that stands out. That's separate. That design isn't, you know, it's not going to flow to the other parts of the development. The other part, of the, so the residential part of the development, it looks a little unorthodox because of its design. Uh, the design is, it's called a Montreal walk-up. So you end up with the ground floor doors being just that, a ground floor. And then another set of doors that are half flight, half a flight of stairs up, two doors side by side. One of those doors goes to the second floor unit. The other door goes to the third floor unit with internal stairways that are the property of the tenant. Um, so right off the bat, the design looks not like anything the city of Saskatoon has seen yet, and I, and I recognize that. We did do a couple of different ideas around the design of the building. Um, and you know one very traditional pointed peaked roofs and the the three colors of brown and a very typical design that you would see one of the things that we wanted to do is give an indication that this is the the idea of this project is a little bit outside of the box and we felt the design of the housing itself needed to kind of bridge the gap between old and new uh, the design owes itself to how we're building this. Uh, we are proposing a development that is using mass timber construction, which is a style of building that uses it's something called cross laminated timber. Uh, it's a whole sector, but essentially what it is, is you're creating very, very thick wood walls where every single wall in the building is a structural wall. It allows you to do things like build more floors that take up less height. Uh, it allows you to do things like energy efficiency where we actually just got our design. To, uh, building A is now fit all of the 
<clears throat> excuse me, it has now checked off all the boxes and we've applied for passive house certification on building A. Building B and C are going to be built to that same standard of passive house certification. So a lot of the things in the design are based us off of some of the things we need to do to create those new, very modern energy efficient homes. Uh, the you know probably the most striking feature is the uh, patios. Um, it is I'm going to turn my screen a bit here. Bear with me, folks. You can see on the picture right behind me here. These patios are likely the one thing that makes it look like it, nothing that anybody's seen before, but those have purpose because of the way those are built. We can attach them to the building in a manner where we're in, where we're not breaking the thermal barrier of the home, making it very, very much more energy efficient and allowing us to significantly reduce heating costs. Uh, everything in this design is built around making sure that these homes are as affordable and as accessible and as sustainable as possible. Uh, the other thing that we're pursuing with this design is uh, the implementation of, it, of some design elements that will make them solar ready. Um, within the framework of uh, the programming that's out there right now, uh, actual installation of solar PV on the roof doesn't make financial sense right now. The math doesn't work. Uh, but in the future, we believe that it will get at some point work. So our design also is built in a way so that we can be ready for that when it comes. We're building these homes to be future proof. So we're not designing a house for today in 2020. Uh, 2020, we should have built a bomb shelter apparently, but it, it, we're not building the house for for today. We're building these to be cutting edge, leading technology 10, 15 years from now and making sure that it's sustainable for, for many, many years to come. So the, the design elements that seem a little out there uh, are very purposeful and intentional so that we can make sure that we're around and serving the neighborhood and the city well in the years to come. Thank you. This may have um, come up already, but there are a couple of questions in relation to why this site, why this area um, was chosen by Camponi for the project? Yeah, you bet. So we spent uh, a couple years actually, when it got right, gets right down to it, uh, looking at a variety of uh, locations, variety of different parcels of land, uh, some available through uh, the city of Saskatoon, some available through private ownership, some available through um, uh, uh, infill scenarios, things like that. Um, we, for the tenants we house, we need to make sure that uh, because of the, the significantly decreased vehicle ownership, we need to make sure that we have excellent connections to community via other methods of transportation. So pedestrian, uh, bike, uh, transit, uh, those are very, very important. They're in fact, are crucial. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, this, these parcels of land at Hart Road answer all of those questions. Uh, in fact, um, it, part of the work that I do in behind the scenes with CMHC and the National Housing Strategy, uh, there's this very large spreadsheet that CMHC has uh, that goes through and lists the, the needs for housing. This is what makes housing uh, vital and accessible and part of a community. These are the important points that you need to consider. And it's all about proximity to things. So proximity to schools, proximity to health, proximity to grocery, proximity to gainful employment, uh, proximity to banking, proximity to social opportunities, uh, proximity to daycares, proximity to libraries, proximities to everything. Uh, it's a very, very long list. These Heart Road parcels check off every single box, every single one. Yeah, and I know that's why a lot of the residents in Park Ridge Extension and Park Ridge and the Blairmore area, that's that's why this isn't such a nice place to live. 
is that you've got everything within a hop, skip and a jump. I'm showing my age there with that turn of phrase, but the, everything is within walking distance. Um, for our families, for our tenant families, that's that's crucially important. Uh, we envision, you know, mom and her children in our housing where she can drop her children off at the daycare that's part of our facility, walk across the street to her, her employment, walk back across the street, get some groceries on the way, do her banking on the way, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and be at home all without taking more than a few hundred steps. And that's that's why that's really important to us. Thank you, Mr. Esterby. Uh, so the next question uh, says that there are, or why are there so many four bedroom units? Um, the comment goes on to say that your complex will bring in approximately 500 more people into an already rental saturated area. So what is the rationale for the, um, the four bedroom units or the number of them? So the four bedroom units that that is so phase one construction has uh, uh, 33 I think is the number four bedroom units I might I see the 32 or 33 um, I'll have to go back and check that um, that's targeting a very very specific need that exists on our waiting list uh, the city of Saskatoon does have an abundance of rentals absolutely in fact as of the end of June, I believe it was, there were over 1,500 vacant one and two bedroom apartments in the city of Saskatoon. On Camponi's waiting list are over 63 families that need three or more bedrooms to properly house their family with their children. There's no end of small apartments. They said vacant because the Saskatoon Housing Authority and private landlords will not overhouse a family. It, it doesn't work, first of all. It's not fair to the family. It's not fair to the children of that family to pile four of them into a bedroom. It's not fair to the mom to figure out how to make that work in a household. And it's not fair to the landlord either because having too many people in a house means that you are taxing that, that home and it's not built for that and you have damage. So we're talking about adequately housing the families that we see on our waiting list, uh, that we see in the community needing this type of housing. It's important to note that we have based our design on these one, one and two and four bedroom units. In phase one, we've said this many one, one bedroom units, this many four bedroom units, and a couple of two bedroom units because we have corners. Uh, uh, we have not set in stone how many of those larger four bedroom units we would have in phase two. Uh, phase two construction, if we were to proceed, would follow probably about 18 to 24 months after the commencement of phase one. Excuse me. And we would, during that time, be keeping track, actively keeping track of what the housing need is, where the housing gaps are that are being seen in the city of Saskatoon and within our own waiting list. If there stops being that need for those four bedroom homes, then we would not uh, we would not build you know 70 more four bedroom homes because then we would have trouble filling. Them. That's not financially sustainable for our organization. So we, we set a general path for us. The specific path laid out in some of those numbers is, is phase one development. Um, I guess there's a kind of a part two to that question as well, too, about density of rental housing. Um, I, I do know, like the Blairmore Suburban Centre, uh, Daryl had it up on the slide earlier, where the, you've got an awful lot of rentals in, in the neighbourhood, especially with the addition of the three new uh, structures to the northeast of the area with those taller, the seven storey buildings. Um, th there is lots of rental property. Um, there's lots of folks that can't afford it, and there's lots of folks that can't can't fit into the housing that does exist in the city. Um, a typical wait time for a family needing a four bedroom home on Camponi's waiting list, a typical wait time is two years. 
and we are the largest housing provider, nonprofit housing provider in the city, and people are waiting for two years with us. So that gives you an idea of just how big that gap is in affordable housing for large families. Thank you, Mr. Esterby. Um, the next question will likely go to you, uh, Mr. Dawson. So this kind of builds on the density question. Um, the comment is we already have almost a thousand rental units in a three block radius. With the addition of hundreds more, what is the city doing or going to do about policing and traffic flow? I mean, thanks, Catherine. Um, so it's, I think it's important to, to remember that this area is a suburban center or an urban center, uh, as we refer to it now. And, and urban centers are designed to be higher density, uh, both within residential units and uh, mixed use units and commercial uses. So it is planned for this area of the city to have higher density. I, I, as far as the traffic and policing, uh, there was a neighborhood traffic review recently done uh, and recommendations were presented to council and there will be uh, implementation of that over over uh, over time as they work to move forward on the recommendations that were adopted from that review. So the the project itself uh, was reviewed by our transportation department and not anticipated to uh, have a, a huge impact on uh, the transportation network uh, beyond what is expected in the area. So I hope that generally answers that question. Thank you, Mr. Dawson. Um, next question is, will there be a limit to vehicles? There are a number of rental units in the area that have approximately three vehicles per unit. So that would be maybe a question more for Mr. Esterby. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we don't obviously we don't have this thing built yet, so we don't have a policy written in place. What we do plan on doing is. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, what we do plan on doing is, is using a policy similar to uh, what we use in our apartment buildings where tenants are allowed to have uh, they have one parking stall assigned to themselves and they're not allowed to have anything else. So it does limit vehicles to one. Um, the other thing, though, is that within our portfolio and within social housing, uh, the vehicle ownership that we've experienced is significantly different than the three vehicles per unit. Um, our, we do not, we really do not uh, create roommate scenarios. Uh, we try, uh, try everything to make sure that we do not create roommate scenarios in our rentals. That never works in affordable housing. It always ends in disaster. So we only usually have one, well, almost always, we have one family unit per unit. Um, we recently did, uh, part, part of the good work of the planning department uh, wanted us to look at that parking in a little more intensive manner. So we recently conducted some surveys within our own portfolio. Uh, we went specifically to each of our apartment buildings uh, and one by one asked all of those tenants, you know, let's talk about vehicles. How many do you have? What types of transportation do you use? And then we also uh, conducted a, a fairly basic, mostly unscientific survey of, of our other single dwelling unit tenants. What we did was have a, <clears throat> excuse me, we had a, a sh short little questionnaire at uh, when they were coming in to pay rent over the last little bit. Um, what we found in that is we got responses from about 150 residents, 150 tenants. Uh, so about uh, probably about a third of our portfolio of those 150 responses, only 56 of those homes owned a vehicle, period. Never mind two or three, but just a ah, vehicle. So we're at we were at about 37 percent vehicle ownership. And, and that reflects what we see in our parking lots at our apartment buildings. Uh, it reflects what we see with people riding the bus or getting rides from friends and family to come pay their rent. Uh, in the pandemic, we we finally took the the step to get our rent payment online. So it you know like things like that. We we have to accommodate our tenants because they don't own vehicles. Uh, the other thing we did is take that those findings that we found within our own portfolio and went to other social housing providers in the city. Um, uh, Stewart Properties, uh, we talked to Quint uh, Development Corporation, 
Uh, we talked with uh, our representatives that we work with at uh, the Saskatoon Housing Authority and, and Saskatchewan Housing Corporation. Uh, overwhelmingly, especially at the Saskatchewan Housing Corporation, the housing authorities in the province, they say their number is at about the 10 to 15 percent ownership of vehicles. The vehicles just aren't a piece of the puzzle because the fact that you are having trouble affording rent at the end of the day means there's not many other things either. You're more worried about making sure that you have the roof over your head and food on the table and a way to get to work in the morning. So, you know, transit is important. Uh, walking distances are important and that's why we've designed the neighborhood in a manner so that we just we have one parking stall per unit, some extra parking stalls for the residual uses the residual traffic that those would generate but we we expect to be well contained within within the parking spots that we have thank you mr Esterby. uh the next question is in relation to roofing height or the building height so mr dawson maybe you can kind of go over what um the proposed building height is for the project as well as how that compares with the neighboring properties and other buildings in that area. Uh, sure, so the, the application that uh, has been submitted, uh, we did take a look at the building height and the building uh, buildings that are on the east and west property lines and on the south property lines uh, are proposed to be a 10 meters, uh, somewhat of a flat roof. So the 10 meters would be measured to the top of the flat roof. Uh, the buildings up front along Hart Road would be the buildings that are proposed to be at 11.8 uh, meters. So when we look at uh, the proposal and how that relates to the current zoning, the current zoning would allow the 10 meter building height. Uh, the zoning bylaw does not limit floors, so uh, we would be looking at doing that within this proposal to say it is three floors. So the the building height for the residential buildings, uh, the setbacks from property lines and the building heights would actually be consistent with what the RM2 zoning allows at this time. Thank you, Mr. Dawson. Uh, next question is in relation to the timeline for the uh, rezoning and uh, neighborhood concept plan amendment. So the question is, um, they would like some clarification in regards to the timeline, as well as whether this is going to be presented to council on September 28th. I can clarify that at this time it is scheduled to be on the public hearing at City Council uh, at 6 p.m. on September 28th. Thank you. Uh, another question for you, Mr. Dawson, is in relation to um, the actual density increase that would result as a change in uh, zoning from RM2 to M3 by agreement. Sure, and that's actually a really good question. Um, so if, if we look at general stats, an RM2 zoning would provide for about 20 units per acre. So the number of units you're going to get on a site is going to depend on how big the site is. Uh, when we did the, the looked at this proposal and broke it down to the number of units per acre, we would get about uh, 33 dwelling units per acre. In total, uh, and, and these are all approximate numbers, it would be about 60, 65 units. Uh, more than what you would typically see in an RM2 zoning, but it would all end up depending on the type of units and the size of units. So um, you know, the, that increase in density is is slightly, but but it is still below what we would see kind of up in that northeast corner of the suburban center. Thank you, Mr. Dawson. Uh, next question, I'll maybe have Mr. Esterby start. And so that's in relation to whether the project has enough uh, parking or whether that's underestimated for this for this project uh for this one we do, we do feel like i said based on based on our experience uh with our tenants that we have in our housing and our various forms of housing right now we we do feel that we've got the the parking the parking number right one of the key things around parking uh we are we are Canadians through and through, and when it's cold outside, we want to park in front of our door. Uh, so you often, that's where you see you know, tra traffic nightmares uh, occur, where if the front door of the building is closer than my parking spot, I'm going to park in that front door of the building. Uh, it's one of the main reasons we really like our design, because everybody has a front door. So we've got assigned parking stalls that are 
right in front of everybody's front door. So that's going to take away the concern of that residual street side parking. Um, the other thing too is that the, the street side, so Hart Road, if, if a tenant was to park on Hart Road, that's actually about as far away from their front door as they could get. Uh, so we really don't see that being a concern or an alternative parking spot. Excuse me. The other thing is that with with our staff on site, we're able to identify if you know someone's car breaks down and they leave it. It's not going to be there for two days. It's going to be there for that morning, and then it's going to get dealt with. But we take the we take the appearance of our, our properties and our relationship with our neighbors very very seriously. Um, the you know the reality of this is that we've. Um, we've looked at this so long and for so many years that we really think we've got this right. Thank you, Mr. Esterby. Our next question um, is in relation to noise. So maybe Mr. Esterby, I'll start with you and Mr. Dawson, you can maybe just uh, chime in in terms of the city's response to this. So the area is already very highly populated and there is a lot of parking, traffic noise and other issues um, that could be exacerbated by this project. Has this been taken into account as to what the general noise level will be? So I'm not sure if you're able to answer that, but certainly I can maybe throw that to Daryl to answer. Sure, why don't, why don't I start as far as uh, you know, noise level? Um, you know, it, it's a good comment in that aspect of vehicle noise and other noise. Outside of all noise, there is the city's noise by law. Uh, but I think that the question is, is about increased in no traffic noise and doors opening and shutting. Uh, that, you know, that's one of the things that this would have been a residential development under the current zoning. And so the zoning proposal adds a few components such as the office and, and uh, limited commercial institutional uses. So when you compare what is there under the current zoning and what's being proposed here, we don't see any change in that, that uh, impact and level with regards to, to noise. Uh, the general comment about noise is, you know, is one that we hear throughout the, the larger urban environment of the city uh, with regards to, you know, louder vehicles and, and traffic noise, et cetera. So, uh, you know, that, that is one that we can take away and discuss with our transportation division. But from, from a planning perspective, uh, when you look at what is being proposed and what could be built there, we don't see any change in that level of noise. I'll I'll add that too, Catherine. If you if you can switch over. Sure. Perfect. Thank you. Um, just to just to take it one step farther with that too. Uh, there's a there's a phrase in the Rentalsman Act uh, called quiet enjoyment, in that every household is entitled to quiet enjoyment. It's, uh, it's quite the phrase, it takes on many different meanings, many different things. Uh, we take it very seriously. We use the right to quiet enjoyment as a tool for lease violations and evictions if we need to. Uh, we don't tolerate things like that in our housing. Um, we work with our tenants and try to support them and try to, to take the opportunity to, to educate them on why it's not a good thing if we can, but we don't waste too much time doing that. Uh, the neighbors of Camponi housing are entitled to quiet enjoyment as are the tenants within Camponi housing. We, we take it very seriously. So just, just know that we're worried about that too. We wanna make sure that our tenants can close their door and make the world go away. Uh, it's one of the reasons why all of the housing faces inward on our development. Nothing faces Hart Road. Uh, that's that's really important to us. We we want to make sure that this is a comfortable, safe, secure place for our tenants that they're really going to enjoy. Thank you, Mr. Esterby. Uh, this question will be for you, Mr. Dawson. So it's in relation to um, the sun and uh, the proposal potentially blocking um, 
sun for neighboring properties. Do you want to comment on that just in terms of what we require um, from a uh, rezoning application perspective? Uh, sure, absolutely. So from a zoning perspective, shadow studies are, are, are not required. Um, when we go into rezonings, we may require them if the building form is substantially different or more dense or taller than what's being proposed. The building height and building form proposed that would impact any of the neighborhood properties is exactly what can be built into the RM2. So shadowing studies were not done uh, as part of the proposal. And sticking with you, Mr. Dawson, um, just a general uh, question, I guess, here. Um, what uh, what would be the takeaway from this public information meeting and um, would anything, I guess, that is said or heard here um, prevent this from moving forward? Um, good, good question. So as far as applications moving forward, uh, applications have the right to be in front of City Council who make the final decisions. Uh, the planning department uh, through a review process internally and then through comments from adjacent property owners will evaluate what we hear and make a recommendation to City Council. So there would, there would uh, likely not be anything from this public hearing that would the planning would say it can't move ahead. An applicant has the right to go to a public hearing and have an application considered by City Council. Uh, depending on what what the comments and questions are heard, you know, we'll definitely be uh, discussing those with Camponi Housing to determine the, um, you know, the the viability and the impact and to determine if there's further actions and how they shape our recommendation. Uh, but ultimately, like I said, it, it is applicants right to go to City Council. Thank you, Mr. Dawson. Um, next question will be for um, Mr. Estreby. So what are Camponi, um, in terms of the corporation, their standards for uh, or guidelines for dealing with crime um, or any illegal activity in in the uh, with the project, if there is any? Uh, this project would be dealt with in a very similar manner to the rest of our portfolio. We have a few different sets of things that we do, so I want to, I guess I want to make sure that I differentiate two very different parts of, of this. Um, we do, we do something called uh, supported living models. Uh, those are very specific housing units that are staffed and supported with social workers and case management workers, uh, you know, health officials, things like that. In those cases, we have a very different set of rules. Uh, we, they are operated from a harm reduction model uh, perspective. Uh, we are trying to, in those types of housing, we are trying literally to keep people alive. Um, and that's a very different thing. That is not what we are proposing here. That is that that does not have a place in this housing development, nor will it ever have a place in this housing development. It needs a very different facility. Um, this housing development would fall under the guidelines that we use with, within the rest of our portfolio. Uh, like I said earlier, we have a zero tolerance, like no strikes and you're out kind of thing uh, for uh, gang activity. We have a zero tolerance for violent crime. Uh, we have a zero tolerance for increased, or sorry, repeated property crime. Uh, that what I say repeated because you, if you do it once, we will put you on lease violation and let you know that if, you, if it happens again, you are done. We're going to evict you. Um, as far as guidelines around the, you know, the criminal activity, that, that's kind of an all encompassing term. So I guess the best way to sum it up is that we we take it very, very seriously and the severity of the action and more importantly, who the action impacted very much factors into our response to it. Um, we do see the odd time where our tenants are victimized. Uh, Vulnerable individuals are called vulner vulnerable individuals because they are vulnerable. And the people in this fine city that recognize them as vulnerable aren't very nice sometimes, to put it mildly. And a lot of times we end up in a situation where something has happened 
that looks to the neighbors like, oh man, that person has done something so wrong. And in reality, what has happened is that, oh man, that person has had something so wrong done to them. So we don't on all things jump in and say, that's it, you're out. We do the homework. We get our wraparound services team involved. We get our maintenance department involved. We get our tenant community relations department involved. We get to the bottom of what happened. If we have camera footage, we review the camera footage. We work with SPS. We figure out with the crime free multi-housing what happened. We get to the bottom of the real story. If it is our tenant that has done something criminal and violent and destructive in the neighborhood, there are 99 situations out of 100 where we pursue eviction in that scenario. Um, we are still, of course, bound by the Rentalsman Act, just as any landlord is in the city, in the province, uh, but we we're, we know it very, very well. And we we build our cases and we get sheriffs involved if we have to. We, we, we do evict. We are not we are not your friendly neighborhood slumlord that is running the housing that you see in the horror stories in the news. We evict the people that are causing trouble. We house the people that need and want sustainable housing. Thank you, Mr. Estabi. Maybe just building on that, there was another um, question here about um, whether Camponi has its own um, internal bylaws in terms of maintenance, so um, garbage and things like that um, has been listed as a concern. Uh, internal bylaws, no, because the like we're not a we're not a municipal organization, so we're not governed. We don't have we can't be governed by bylaws. As, as a nonprofit corporation, we need to have a set of policies. Uh, so we we have like our our governance bylaws, but those don't. The governance bylaws don't dictate anything to the operational stuff. We do have uh, operational procedures that are very, very laid out. We're actually doing a complete review of them right now, just as something else. Um, the so we do have some really well constructed um, policies that we that we use within our portfolio. Um, our notion with this development is actually to refine and and adjust just for this development because of the scale of this and the way that it's excuse me the way that it's set up. Um, there are some things we can do even better uh, than you know where we have uh, common common uh, garbage pickup, uh, common laundry facilities, common things like that within a neighborhood. Uh, because we're on site, that means that we have. We have even more control over the appearance of things like that. So garbage is a big one. Um, I, after that wind last weekend, I was down here, and you know the the Walmart part. I think every piece of paper and anything from the Walmart parking lot ended up in about 10 square feet in the southeast corner of the fence in in what what is 703 Hart Road. It's things like that, that having that on-site team and our policies in place, you know, that that doesn't sit for four days like it did until likely one of the residents cleaned it up because they were sick of looking at it. It it gets cleaned up that day because we're there and because we care about what it looks like. So we, we're really looking forward to, uh, frankly, we're looking forward to impressing everybody with just how much we actually do want to be a very vibrant part of the neighborhood. Thank you, Mr. Estraby. Uh, just a comment here and someone um, can jump in if they'd like. So the comment goes on to say we have huge existing traffic issues in Blairmore. Uh, the city just finished a study for this neighborhood. Why would you change an RM2 to a high density dwelling until now? And that it appears counterproductive. No, that I, I'll actually I'll start on that one. Um, with the the neighborhood traffic review, they did go in and take a look at the transportation patterns, and we'll go back and visit the uh, the concerns we've heard about traffic and parking with our transportation colleagues. Uh, ultimately, we you know we have to look at this site already was a development site, already was going to impact and and be accounted for in traffic flow and patterns. 
the 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 number of units is uh, 60 units more than what would have been proposed uh, on an average. So that we have to understand that this site was going to be developed, was going to have an impact on parking traffic in the area. The initial analysis by the by the en engineers indicated that it wasn't going to change things substantially, but uh, what we will do though is go back and revisit that information with our colleagues to make sure that uh, you know that that we didn't miss anything in that evaluation. So I think we've heard that pretty consistently about ensuring the appropriate parking and impacts on traffic um, and, and on street parking uh, that, that has been said substantially in, uh, in a number of the questions. So that is one we'll, we'll be revisiting uh, with our colleagues. Uh, just I've got a further to that as well too, Catherine. Thank you. Um, as part of the work that we've done as well too in, in uh, starting this design and, and getting down the road with uh, the planning department city of Saskatoon, we actually did uh, also uh, engage a traffic engineer to look at the impacts of our um, of our of our development on the surrounding neighborhood. So, so separate of that traffic review that was done by the city, we we did one specifically for our own purposes um, to look at how our flows impacted the city. Uh, it helped us around the design of where the inflows and the egress were in the design itself. Uh, so our our traffic engineers looked at that, and, and that's. The, the the findings there are similar to what we we're finding in parking is that the the impacts on the community aren't anything aren't in in excess of what was already intended to be there um so we again we really don't think that it's going to have a, uh, a detrimental impact or a further detrimental impact on the parking that's that's some of the challenges that exist in the neighborhood Uh, thank you, Mr. Asterby. Further question on parking. Uh, so the comment says there is a huge parking issues already. The city is not listening. I have lived in Blairmore for seven years and parking has worsened every year. We have owners parking and visitor parking, which we have to get ticketed daily. Parking is a major issue. So where do visitors park? So I, I maybe I'll just answer that one. Um, within our uh, review, we're going to look at having some on-site visitor parking space. There would also be uh, you know, limited parking on the road, understanding um, both from the residents and site inspections that the on-street parking is pretty limited in the area, uh, but that would be the intent. But once again, that would go back to that comment we've heard about parking and traffic pretty consistently tonight. So we'll, uh, you know, Catherine, Haven and I will be looking at that a little bit closer with, with Cam Pony. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dawson. Just moving on to a question, a general question about why the proposal um, being designed wouldn't fit into the current zoning. So maybe we could just go over a high level what, um, again, what the differences would be in terms of the R RM2 zoning district and the M3. That seems to be a common question. Sure, now, and from a zoning perspective, so the RM2 only allows for the dwelling units. Uh, in order for this to fit a mixed use, which does hit other uh, targets and goals of the city. Uh, the M3 zoning district allows for other types of uses like office, uh, some uh, community uses, etc. Uh, so going to an M3 zoning district allows for that mixed use development, but the residential component, the building height, particularly in those buildings would be exactly like in the RM2. So the zoning agreement specifically to an M3 allows for those additional uses of office, limited commercial and in and institutional uses uh, as well as uh, the parking primarily and the 1.8 meter building height uh, taller building height along heart road buildings only so that's why we do a zoning agreement to address those those three main points uh, thank you mr dawson uh, just a general question here will adjacent property owners know what the recommendation will be before it goes to city council so i'm assuming that's in reference to the city's recommendation yeah so the the any reports that go to city council are public the week before uh, we'll make sure information is on the city's engage page with regards to the city's recommendation we also want to ensure that individuals wishing to make presentation to city council have that information as well 
Thank you, Mr. Dawson. And I may have um, I may have glazed over this question earlier, but I know there was a question in relation to retail space. Um, so, Mr. Asterby, uh, there was a comment about uh, the amount of commercial or retail space already in the area, and maybe just go over what um, your project would entail in terms of the commercial portion. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we've in, we've included that the it's one of the reasons why we need to look at moving to that M3 to allow things like that. Now, it's not that we are building another strip mall along our road. That's not even close to our intent. What what we want to do there is create a very small chunk of retail space. What we're working with uh, Lands Branch and, and planning on there is is limiting the size of the retail space to approximately 1,000 square foot units, probably not that many of them. The plan as it sits right now for phase two incorporates, I think it's just under 8,000 square feet of, of uh, <clears throat> excuse me, 8,000 square feet of retail space along Hart Road divided into units that are 1,000 to 1,200 square feet. So very small things. What we envision for this is is not full-blown retail so this we, we want to do some social enterprise work uh social enterprise is is essentially business with a purpose so our intent is to look for community partners organizations like gdi perhaps gabriel demont institute or demont tech uh other employment agencies whatever it might be and, and work with individuals to maybe do some small micro loans uh, some startup businesses, kind of business incubators. Uh, you've you, you're seeing a few of the banks uh, work on this incub incubator idea, where the notion is employment is getting more and more challenging to find, especially now uh, in the midst of this. Uh, and we need to get creative to make sure that we're getting people back to work and make, making sure we're giving the ability to for people to find work. So self-employment is a for some is a great way to answer that question but how do you get started so those incubator spots is is what we envision doing with the little bit of retail space that we have uh, very guided very specific um, we've talked at length about like we we are not going to put a starbucks down the road from the timmy's we're not going to put a a and w across from the green donald's that we're, we're not interested in running businesses we don't want to do that uh, what we want to do is empower people to come up with an idea on their own and give them a head start on something in a small, small space that we're working with them and, and can help them get up off up on their own two feet. If that business then becomes a vibrant business and they become a lessee in one of the vacant units like the one that I'm in right now and on along Betts Avenue, great. It's a new business for the neighborhood, new choice for whatever service or product they're providing. That's great. If they end up finding another business location in another part of the city, great. And if they end up not being a viable business, well, hey, we tried. But that's what we're trying to do with the retail there. It's not full blown retail in any in any way what we're intending to do there. Thank you, Mr. Asterby. Our next question is for you as well. So um, Camponi Housing Corporation has a retirement building or mentioned a retirement building. I would be supportive of a retirement care home type development without retail space. Would Camponi consider that instead for our small community? I uh, well, part of this development is is that the ground floor uh, very specifically in phase one the ground floor 35 units that's exactly what we intend the the units to be used for uh, we may fit in there some individuals with acquired brain injury like i was saying uh, with acquired brain injury challenges uh, but for the most part we intend to have our seniors and our elders in those units uh, the ability to age in place is so so important for mental health um, and and it can really be a huge benefactor to a community uh, to have elders embedded in a, in a larger community. Um, as far as a care home facility, that's not something that Camponi Housing uh, does at this point. Uh, we, you know, our, 
our senior housing that we have right now, it's, it's not a care home facility. The, the folks in there are uh, self-sufficient. We spend an awful lot of time with them, but it's just because they're really cool and we like to spend a lot of time with them. Um, so that there's no, it's not that type of arrangement and we, and we don't have, we don't have any expertise in the, in the care home field. Um, we have grand visions of maybe doing that somewhere down on the road someday, but it, at this point, it's it's absolutely not part of this development. Um, it, it's it's an avenue that we might explore in the future, but we're sure not ready for it anytime soon. We just don't have the knowledge. Thank you, Mr. Estreby. Another question for you um, is in relation to why other Indigenous groups have not stepped up, stepped up, pardon me, and offered Indigenous lands for this project. That's a really interesting question. Um, partnership is key for an organization like ours. Um, the reality of land development uh, by in Indigenous nations within the city of Saskatoon, obviously the creation of urban reserves like Muskeg Lake or uh, Kekistawa and Hampton Village now or something like that. Um, the Those are predominantly used by the First Nation that is associated with it for development that is specific to their needs. Uh, there's a lack of opportunity for that, so they need to use those for their development. Uh, the other thing in that is that our organization is a Métis organization. Now, we're, we're not affiliated in any way with the Métis Nation of Saskatchewan. In fact, it is within our governance bylaws that we remain apolitical. So we re, it is within the rules that we follow for my board of directors and my board of trustees and my and myself and my leadership team. Uh, it is mandated that we are not politically affiliated within the Métis Nation of Saskatchewan or any other political affiliation for that matter. So being a Métis company, uh, there's, there's that split. Uh, so indigenous lands within the city of Saskatoon, absolutely those exist. Métis lands within the city of Saskatoon, well, Round Prairie was 40 miles to the south. Uh, when Round Prairie was moved to closer to the city of Saskatoon, you created what came to be known as the road allowance people. That is the essence of this area of the Métis nation and a large part of the Métis nations of Saskatchewan, Alberta, and Manitoba. So there, there aren't any traditional lands that the Métis have in a portfolio right now to partner with us. Uh, there's, no, there's no such construct within ownership, within government, anything like that. Uh, whether that comes someday, it's not my concern, it's not my problem, it's for the Métis Nation of Saskatchewan to figure out and 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 that's out there and we keep it out there. We 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 want to house people in housing uh, and we're good at that and we'll stick to where we're good. So we absolutely want to pursue partnerships with other organizations and other indigenous organizations. Uh, we you know we work a lot hand in hand with Crest Housing, which is the housing uh, housing uh, Corporation that is uh, a branch of uh, the Saskatoon Tribal Council. Uh, we collaborate with a lot of different organizations and we're trying to grow that collaboration. But as far as physical land partnerships, uh, those lands are so few and far between. The First Nations that have those holdings within city limits, they, they already have so many things that they need to accomplish with those types of things. Thank you, uh, Mr. Esterby. Uh, next question, I believe, will be for Mr. Dawson. So how much does, this, does the city see this proposed development affecting the future of Park Ridge Extension and its own development? And uh, a common concern that has come up is uh, the potential uh, decrease in house values in the area. So if you could speak to that, please. Sure. So. Um, you know, as far as impact on the on the Park Ridge extension, uh, you know, this area was meant for a dwelling group, so this this would be a dwelling group. So I don't see the uh, the impact on um, you know the 
with regards to the sale or the, the development of that area, uh, as this form of development would be very similar to what uh, could have occurred in there. Now, as far as, um, you know, in the second part of that question on effect on property values, um, any of the evidence we have shown or, or received that uh, development uh, that is compatible doesn't have a negative impact on property values. Uh, even a slight increase in density does not have a negative impact on property values. Uh, that's based on any of the research that we've done and seen uh, with related to overall development within an urban setting. Thank you, Mr. Dawson. And sticking with you, another question in relation to setbacks. So how far from the south side of the townhouses would the building start? And so I'm not sure maybe um, Toby has that information. So what the, can you repeat the question, please, Catherine? Sure. So it's how far from the south side of the sites of the townhouses or the buildings, where would that start? So essentially what the setback would be. Okay, and so I, uh, I don't have that off the top of my head either. Yeah, I just took a quick look at the site plans that I had pulled up, um, and I believe those are also available on the engage page. Uh, but it would be six meters from the south side yard, which would be the same as what would be allowed under an RM2 zoning district. Thank you. Um, next question well, will be for Mr. Esterby. Um, so the question uh, or company had stated that parking will not be a problem. Um, how can you predict that there will only be one vehicle to um, per unit and families grow, children's come of age and turn 16 and they buy cars? So just a, a comment there and a question if you're able That's to answer. Great. Yeah, that's a very fair question. Uh, like I said, we actually do plan to deal with it with with some very structured rules uh, similar to what we're doing with our apartment buildings. Uh, tenants will only be allowed uh, one parking one parking stall per unit. Um, right now, if we have somebody that's parking two or three vehicles, uh, they get a lease violation. Uh, and those lease violations build the case for eviction. So in a, in a situation like that, you know, you raise a good example. Uh, I, I, I am advocating for the ability for a family to call a place home for the years throughout uh, growth within the family, teenagers with cars, whatever it might be. Um, worse, teenagers with junky cars. Uh, so what we do in a situation like that in our portfolio as it exists right now, is simply we're sorry but this isn't allowed so you need to make other arrangements now that seems probably like an oversimplified answer but when it's applied as a rule it means that that family has no choice but to park the car at grandma's house or somebody's house or not have the car uh, the other thing that we're going to actively control is the street side parking. Uh, so if we have a problem vehicle that is being identified by our neighbors consistently, they're always parked in front of my house. This is a common, uh, a common thing in uh, some of the neighborhoods in, oh, forgive me you guys, I can't, I don't, I'm not sure what neighborhood, what the neighborhood name is, but uh, Avenue S North area in the neck of the woods. Uh, we have some housing up there and almost none of it has driveways. So nobody has a driveway. There's all these beautiful yards, narrow lots. Nobody has a driveway and we're constantly dealing with uh, concerns from neighbors uh, where cars are parked in front of the wrong house. Uh, in those instances, we've issued lease violations. We've we've towed our own tenants cars because they won't move them and we've charged. We've back charged them for the cost of towing them. So we, we take the concerns expressed in real time and deal with them. We lease violate them. The, the, the notion of using those lease violations is to build a case to threaten eviction and use that as a tool for stabilizing the housing or to evict and eliminate the concern. Uh, our preferred course of action is stable housing. And if we can accomplish that with our team of holistic support, we'll, we'll accomplish that. If we can't accomplish that, quiet enjoyment of our, by our neighbours and by our tenants rules all. And 
we would move to evict the, the, the challenges and the problems that are being created there. Thanks, Toby. Just another um, question. Can you explain uh, emergency shelter? So what that means or what that entails? Uh, well, with respect to this, uh, this development, uh, emergency shelter is a bit of a misnomer. I, I, I believe we had to have it in there. If I remember right, Daryl, we had to have it in there because of the, the wording and the zoning. Um, we have we have the six special needs units uh, that are going to be, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, are essentially the third floor above our office uh, with secured entry and, and a little bit of a safer environment. Uh, we we have a few different ideas on where the need lies in that, whether it's uh, you know su supported because we have an elevator to it and it's wheelchair wheelchair accessible. Uh, maybe supported homes for uh, complex disabilities, uh, or we may do um, a form of shelter for uh, emergency housing uh, in, the, in the notion that, uh, you know, families that have found themselves suddenly homeless. Uh, you see the emergency shelter wording takes on a little bit of, of a different meaning in these times because of the challenges faced in the downtown core. Uh, so the word shelter often brings in a whole lot more to the conversation. Uh, we're not, you know, a, a shelter environment similar to that you would see at uh, Crossroads with the Salvation Army or the Lighthouse or the Y, uh, similar scenarios like that. <clears throat> we're not proposing that type of shelter environment. That's not what we mean by that emergency shelter. Um, it's, uh, we're not in, again, that's another field that we're not experts in. We don't, we work in partnership with those organizations. Um, we work with them to try and find housing for the folks that are really struggling. Um, but we're in this development, that's not going to be part of the, a part of the mix. It, it doesn't fit in this development. It, it, it just, it, again, that goes back to the housing continuum and continuum and being very specific about what we're targeting with which buildings. So the this development, it, it doesn't fit to have a shelter environment here. You're not close to food security. You're not close to programming. Um, it, it, there's just not not a part of it that works on this on this location. Thank you, Mr. Esterby. Uh, Daryl, I may just jump to you just on a follow up question about um, property values, and I'm not sure if you're able to answer this, but the research cited saying that high density dwellings won't lower the value of nearby houses. Does that research look at affordable housing specifically? Um, I I'd have to go back and take a look, but I know any of our research on residential care homes related to uh, uh, their impact form of building form and development uh, show that there was no uh, direct uh, relationship. So uh, the you know it, it's important to know within planning, we look at the land use, not the land user. And when we look at land use, we're looking at multi unit dwellings and, and that sort of use. So those impacts uh, and how they impact property values, uh, they're, they're, there's no connection. The other notion there around the like we're affordable housing affordable housing is known in the general public as low rentals low rentals have attached to them this cloud of things it's there because it's been there for years uh it's it's negative and for a vast majority of the people that access the housing in affordable housing, it is it, it's wrong. Uh, these are families that are just trying to make ends meet like the rest of us with more modest means than many to make those ends meet. Uh, these are these are good families. The the notion of what Camponi housing wants to do is to bring this housing together. That's you know that's key to why RM2 wouldn't work. 
if we were to plop down RM2 housing and walk away and have it be rentals, some of the fears that have been expressed over the last few weeks may be well placed, but that's not our intent. And that's why we need to look at the zoning to go to M3. We need to be here. We need to support the housing that we create. It is key to what we do. Our Camponi's vacancy rate right now is hovering around 4%, 5%. Uh, it is made up entirely of the units that we have to count as being vacant while we get them ready for the next tenant. As soon as we have one ready to go, we move somebody in. Our arrears right now are at 2%. All of our renters, except for 2% of our portfolio, have paid their rent on time. That's not how it used to be. When we started looking at holistic housing supports and what impact they could have within our portfolio, we expected it to have an effect on our arrears. We expected it to have an effect on the tenure of our tenants. What we realized was that it had every effect on those things. So we knew that when we did this development, we needed to make sure that we were on site so that we could make sure this doesn't turn into that, that idea out there of low rent housing. When you say low rent housing to half of the people in this city, the vision that comes with that is derelict housing, slumlords and property crime. And, and other crime. We spend every hour of every day of work that the organization does to make sure that we minimize and negate those things within our portfolio. It, our, our goal is to work in opposition to that. So we, we take that so very seriously. And, and I, it, it, me saying it uh, in words on a, Zoom or a Windows presentation, whatever this is. I, I recognize that that does not. That does not do much to quell the concern when. You see sensationalized media drawing out horrible conclusions right in front of our eyes in the city of Saskatoon. It is our intent to use this neighborhood to be the opposite of that, and that's why we need the zoning change so that we can do the work that we know needs to, be, needs to be done so that that type of thing isn't created. We will not create that type of neighborhood because we're going to be in this neighborhood. Thank you, Mr. Esterby. Just one more question with respect to security. You had mentioned uh, having their own security on site. Can you explain a little bit further about what that means? Yeah, for sure. So, um, because of the size of the facility and, and what we do, um, it, this whole project has been about finding synergies. I just realized, oh, I am off mute. Okay, good. I muted myself. I thought I'd committed a Daryl. Um, with this whole thing, it was about finding synergies uh, in, and how we could be more fiscally responsible with how we spend our money. Um, so like from a maintenance perspective, uh, put housing in a concentrated area, it's easier to maintain simple things like that from the security aspect what that looks like is right now we have uh, around the clock maintenance on call uh, and we use a, a call service that many organizations do uh, to when we forward our phones when we leave the office turn that back off when we get into the office in the morning and they handle our cars our, our calls at night one of the synergies that we've identified is that we can do our own on call service at night. We can monitor multiple camera locations from one spot, including Hart Road, but also some of our other stuff. Uh, we can monitor all of our housing throughout the city. We can respond quicker if we do it ourselves. And lo and behold, we can save some money because now we don't have to pay a call service. We don't have to pay those those call out fees. So we're going to what that what security on site 24 seven looks like means that we'll have staff in our office building on the ground floor. That is 
active and present and monitoring the area. Now, when I say the area, I mean the area of our uh, within our, the, the confines of the land. Uh, it's when I say cameras, we're not going to have cameras pointing into everybody's backyard. Uh, that's like it's internal and and the fences and things like that. So, you know, very, very specific uh, things that we want to keep track of. Uh, but that's how we control the, you know, even the, the beginnings of crime. Uh, property crime especially is a crime of convenience. Um, if petty theft is a, is a crime of convenience, if it is inconvenient and known to be inconvenient to do stupid stuff in Camponi's Heart Road development, the, the people doing it are going to go to the next spot that they find that's a little more convenient. So we're going to start that right from day one. Before we're even built, we would get it out there and make sure everybody's really, really aware that we're going to have staff on site. The deterrent is the purpose. Thank you, Mr. Estraby. And just a general question, I'm not sure who's best to um, potentially respond to this, but it's in relation to the capacity of areas or schools in the area to handle um, a potential increase in children. I can I can start speaking to that. Um, uh, so one, one of the reasons why we uh, selected this spot is the proximity to, to multiple schools. Um, so there's the obviously as the neighborhood would know, there's the there's a, a public and a Catholic elementary school within walking distance and a public and a Catholic high school within walking distance. Um, we've we've started an engagement process. Uh, we didn't want to intrude too much because good Lord, those teachers have enough to deal with right now. Um, but we've started a process of talking about what that looks like in a couple years and and what we can do to help. Um, you know, we, we've we've also identified that like there is there is a school area designated in the Kensington development. It's obviously obviously a few years off and it's not in the province's radar either. So that's that's something that we're keeping a close eye on as well too. But one of the things that we do um, actively right now actually within with other schools, uh, we very much get involved with the schools uh, that our tenants send their families to. Uh, be it Westmount or Princess Alexandra or uh, any of the Pleasant Hill school, things like that. Uh, our tenant engagement program reaches out to the school coordinators and, and works hand in hand to develop some really cool engagement stuff. Uh, we, our goal is to, is, is to absolutely have an impact on the schools, a very positive one. Uh, you know, we, we have we can access funding for programming. We can access funding for neighborhood development stuff. We can access programming for community rinks. We can access all that kind of stuff. And we really want to get involved with the education of the children that our, our families would have and in turn obviously have, a, have the residual benefit on the families that, that would call us neighbors. Thank you. Um, we're approaching nine o'clock, so I'm just going to take a few more questions. Um, we've had uh, a large number of questions come in, so we certainly appreciate um, the engagement on this project. Uh, any questions that we're not able to answer tonight, you can certainly um, contact me. I'll have my contact information um, up on the screen in a second. But uh, jumping to um, one last question here, is just in relation to uh, again the process that has been undertaken by the city and uh, why I guess the public engagement uh, took place um, after proceeding to the Municipal Planning Commission and Daryl I'll maybe let you speak to that. No absolutely uh, no and good question so uh, part of the process is we wanted to ensure we had uh, opportunity to continually answer questions and, and just hear input from the community. Uh, Planning reports are considered by the Municipal Planning Commission, but the role of Municipal Planning Commission is to evaluate a proposal based on the technical merits uh, of an application. So the Planning Commission has reviewed this application. 
they're an independent body that provides a, 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 a committee that provides a recommendation on zoning applications to our city council. Uh, so they're part of the process um, and advising on it. So the, the Municipal Planning Commission has reviewed this proposal. Uh, they have a recommendation, recommend, their own recommendation separate from administration that they would uh, review uh, and provide at the time of a public hearing. Uh, in order for us to continue uh, just hearing from the, the public and, and, and a lot of that is to deal with the, the challenges of, of engagement right now during the, uh, during the time of the COVID pandemic. Uh, planning has faced some challenges and one of the things we wanted to do was reach out through this, uh, this forum. Um, with, without it, we would have held a public information meeting uh, in the community, but the, those options just aren't with us right now. Uh, but this is really about a chance to ask questions and get information and to continue that process and, what, and, and then allow administration to make her own recommendations separate of the Municipal Planning Commission uh, that would be presented to City Council. If I can add to that a little bit, Catherine, too. Perfect, thank you. Um, the uh, the whole consultation piece, I, I, like Daryl said, it's it's very, very, very unusual. Uh, right now in the times of COVID, we are not going to soon forget to this, hopefully one year. Um, Camp Pony Housing really, really takes that seriously. We wanted to we wanted to get in front of our the people that we want to call neighbors. Uh, you know the business community, the residential community, the residuals community, the resi residual community around it. Um, so, like the the storefront that I'm sitting in right now, like this is a temporary thing. Uh, we we made the commitment to take a vacant spot for a for a couple months here, and we've been sitting here uh, ready to tell the story of of what what we're doing. And, and I thank those of you that have come down to to hear it and 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 ask some hard questions. Um, you know, like we we want to continue being an engaged neighbor. Right now we're a, a potential neighbor. We want to be a future neighbor, and in the future we want to be a great neighbor. Uh, and the only way you do that is with constant communication. Um, if anybody's, we can't tell, just we can't tell who's on the call. So if anybody's out there that knows me, um, I call it like it is sometimes, most times to my own detriment. Um, so you will always get an honest opinion from me. Um, if I don't agree with you, you will know it. And I want that from the folks that we would call neighbors with Camponi Housing. If there is something that you do not think is going to work. We've we've been here wanting to hear that, and, and we've heard it. Uh, some of the you know some of the things about uh, parking concerns, things like that, and, and that's why we did a lot of the work that we did around the parking studies and things like that. In the future, going forward, what that looks like is constant engagement. The engagement process for Camponi Housing doesn't end tonight, or it doesn't end at a council meeting, or it doesn't end at a shovel sod turning ceremony. It never ends. Uh, the, the engagement and the consultation continues on because that's how you be a good neighbor. Uh, so just just know that even though it isn't exactly what it would normally be because of COVID, uh, we're, we're proud to have made the extra commitment that we did. Um, we we went above and beyond what the what the planning department. Uh, normally would have us do by having this storefront location and it, and it served us well. It's, it's allowed us to tell our story to a great many people and you know just just like we have tonight in, a, in kind of an abbreviated form. Thank you Mr. Asterby. Um, any closing comments um, from you Mr. Dawson? Uh, you know in, in closing um, what I would just like to add is, uh, you know, I appreciate everyone uh, who joined tonight, who provided comments. Uh, um, you know, those comments came in. Catherine read them out uh, for Toby and I to respond to. Uh, like I say, they, uh, as planners, like to deal in person and, uh, and see the faces and, and be able to have that communication. But given the circumstances, I really appreciate this opportunity to use the technology we have to have this meeting to 
hear the comments from individuals and provide information back on the proposal and talk about the process. So just a, just a thank you is what, uh, what I want to conclude with. Thank you, Mr. Dawson, and I'll turn it over to you, uh, Mr. Astorby. Any closing comments? Yeah, you bet. Thanks. I, again, I'll just echo what Daryl said. Um, we, we've we built an entire company using coffee and handshakes, so this is this is not my preferred method either, but but the technology has, has at least enabled us to continue marching down so that we can serve housing need in the city of Saskatoon. And, and, I, and I thank the city for uh, doing the best that they can in the times of COVID to make it happen. Um, I want to say thank you to the people that did come in. Uh, you know, a ton of questions, a ton of really great questions, uh, and and we take each and every one of them seriously. Like I said, so um, we'll continue to be accessible to you. I encourage anyone that has more questions that they would like to hear an answer from me on. If you go to camponi.ca, uh, there's every way to get through to us. Uh, stop by the office. We've got lots of plexiglass everywhere and masks and everything like that. Uh, I'm more than my staff can connect you to me on the phone. Happy to answer and continue answering any questions that anybody may have. And I look forward to uh, continuing the dialogue. Thank you, Mr. Astorby. So that concludes our presentation for tonight. So my uh, contact information is on your screen right now. Um, the Cities Engage page, the link is there as well. So please go to the Cities Engage page to monitor any updates for the project. And um, certainly contact myself if you feel like your questions um, weren't answered. All of the comments and questions that we did receive um, have been documented. So I didn't read out uh, all comments, um, but certainly those will be used as part of our um, part of our process and uh, will certainly be taken into account. So I appreciate that. So on behalf of myself, um, Mr. Dawson, Mr. Astorby and Ms. Reese, I'd like to thank you again for taking the time um, to uh, spend with us tonight to discuss this project. And again, feel 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 free to reach out to me. Um, thanks again and have a good rest of your evening.